It's a pleasure to be here and have a chance to talk to all of you about this very exciting topic of demographics. <laughs> I uh, appreciate the very nice invitation. You know, I don't always get such nice invitations. I was once presenting to a civic group down in East Texas, and it's a small group, small town, and the gentleman who was designated to introduced me and had practiced got ill at the last moment and so another gentleman as he walked in about five minutes before the presentation gets handed my introduction and I'm sitting there as the speaker often does looking around and I see this guy and he's going over this and I know that he's having trouble with this word demographer and of course time came he got up and he said you know Dr. Murdoch's done a lot of rural things he's done a lot of dim Dem, well, I guess he's just best seen as a rural demagogger. Well, I'm going to hope not to be a rural demagogger today. I do want to talk to you about demographic change in Texas because we've had yet another decade of phenomenal change. A decade that despite what some people often accuse me of, of, of seeing too radical changes, and in general, I have been too conservative Yet again, a former chancellor of A&M used to say to me, Steve, you're always conservative, which is not what I'm normally accused of. But anyway, we're going to look a little bit of population change. We're going to look at this diversity issue, which is really the key issue if you look at it in terms of change. We'll talk about the aging of the population because that's still happening and still important. And then we'll talk about some of the implications. Let's start off by looking at this chart, and, and as you know, I, I apologize for some charts like this. I have, a, I have a friend, actually I have two friends, but one of my friends has told me, he says, you know what I like about you Murdoch is you take about 600 numbers, you put them on a slide, put them up in front of a bunch of people and you say, as you can plainly see. Well, this is one of those slides. <laughs> but you know, the phenomenal thing we're seeing here is uh, the growth of Texas. And it was interesting when I recently got a call from a reporter in New York and he said, well, you had this 20.6% change. That must have been one of the biggest percentage changes, maybe the biggest percentage change in the history of Texas. To the answer which I started reading him down this row here to show him that no, it wasn't. It was a good sized change, but it was not in percentage terms at least. It was an interesting uh, decade for the country because as you see, this rate of change is second slowest only to the 30s in terms of US population change. Well, let's look at this in a little more detail. And one of the things I want to show you here and I want you to look at is this over here. Because about half the calls I get out of state go something like this. Well, you're having a lot of growth in Texas. But when immigration goes away, you guys are going to be dead in the water. Because there's an image out there, and even among some Texans, that a majority of our growth is a result of immigration. Well, notice over here, and we only have through 2009, 54% of our growth is natural increase, the excess of births over deaths. Another 21% has been domestic migration. That is people from other states coming to Texas. And 24% of our growth is international immigration, both documented and undocumented. The point of it is, is that Texas growth is multifaceted. It is not one sourced, uh, and as a result, its uh, longevity, I think, is likely to continue, not necessarily at the rate that we've had before. Just to kind of give us a little uh, you know, background, those uh, states up there in gold lost seats, the dark blue uh, states gained seats. We, of course, gained four. Uh, if you look at our growth in terms of what's happening in terms of the largest states, just notice that whether you look at it in numerical terms or you look at it in percentage terms, Texas stands out among these large states. When you look at it in terms of numerical increases, notice that although we're 12 million smaller than California, we, we had more than 900,000 more people added to our population uh, in this last decade than they did in absolute numerical terms. And notice as well that when you look at us in percentage terms, people say, well, we're only fifth on percentage terms. But notice the size of those other states. And as a result of that, of course, the larger you are, the harder it is to have a percent, any percentage increase in change. And so, it's phenomenal, the growth that we've had, whether you look at it numerically, whether we look at it relatively, whether we look at it in uh, percentage terms. We are part of a general pattern, and I think that's important to understand, and that is most of the growth, most of the time, for at least the last century in the United States, has been in the South and the West. 
What this shows is the proportion of growth from 2000 to 2010 in the United States that was due to the South and the West. You see 85% of the growth occurred in either the Southern or Western parts of the United States. In fact, the trend is this. If you looked at the beginning of the 20th century, 62% of the population lived in the Northeast and Midwest. 38% lived in the South and the West. By the end of the decade, well, and by this decade, I should say, by 2010, Basically, 40% lived in the Northeast and Midwest, and 60% lived in the South and West. That has been a substantial shift. In fact, I tell students in my classes, you know, if you think politicians love us because they like our food, because they like our climate, you're wrong. They like us because of our votes. And that is increasingly obvious in terms of the importance of the South and West and all kinds of uh, factors that we look at. Well, let's look at Texas. I'm going to start off by looking at Council of Government Regions. And notice especially North Central Texas, that is the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Houston-Galveston area. You can guess where that capital area is here, of course, Alamo area, San Antonio, and down in the valley, the lower Rio Grande and South Texas areas. And the reason I bring those up is the right-hand most chart, part of this chart shows the percent of all state growth from 2000 to 2010 that came in just those, par it came in various parts of the state. And notice that each of the Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston areas got about 29% of all the people added to Texas, okay? And you can see then if you add the Alamo area, you add the capital area, and you throw in the lower Rio Grande, you're talking about 85% or so of our growth that came from just those parts of Texas. That's why with this phenomenal growth, this 4,294,000 increase in our population, by far the largest numerical increase in our history, Despite that, we actually had 10 more counties that lost population in this decade than last decade. And that is a function, if you will, of the concentration of that growth. We see it as well in metropolitan areas. I won't spend a lot of time on these. They're ranked. Uh, you can see these, and I'm going to make these available uh, through Evan uh, to whoever wants to, to get them at the end of the presentation. Let's talk just a little bit to give an idea on some of the, of the range of this. This is the largest counties in Texas. This is their growth, rates of growth and change. You can see uh, how extensive some of them were. Uh, Harris County leading the way, no matter how you look at it. This is the terms of the, those with the largest numerical increases. And what you see here is that we had some very substantial growth, not just in the central city counties, but in many suburban counties. And I think, of course, what, what stands out extensively is Dallas County's growth was relatively small. Now, we could talk about that forever. In fact, we could have a whole uh, meeting and a whole presentation series on that. We won't today, uh, but it is indicative of a variety of things. This is the largest percentage increases. No surprise here, these are virtually all suburban counties, okay? And suburban growth has exceeded in percentage terms yet again that in central cities in most parts of, of Texas and parts of the country. If you look at it in terms of change here, those dark shaded blue counties are the fastest growing, the dark green are the second. You can see that that's that 68 counties in the 1990s that lost population, and this is the 79 that lost population uh, in this particular decade from 2000 to 2010. Now let's talk about race and ethnicity, and I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about these various percent files. And I want you to notice here the numerical changes that occurred in Texas population from 2000 to 2010. And although it's a little belabored, I'll go through it because I think it's important to keep this in mind. Non-Hispanic white, the Anglo population increased by 464,000 people <coughs> by 4% compared to the 20% for the state. The Hispanic population increased by nearly 2.8 million by 42%, the non-Hispanic or black population increased by 522,000. So with 11% of the population base in 2000, the black population increase exceeded the Anglo population increase that was 50% basically of the population at that time. Asians also grew particularly in percentage terms. And if you kind of take all these together and put it in an other category, the African American, the Hispanic, and the other category grew faster than the Anglo population. <coughs> now, what does that mean? Well, we know that about 2003 or 4, depending on which estimate you believe, Texas became less than half Anglo. And that as we say, look at 2010, what we see is that 
of that popul of our population is now Anglo, 38% Hispanic, 12% basically African American, et cetera. One of the biggest surprises up here is that if you'd ask most demographers, and particularly most sociologists, they would have suggested that this two or more race category would explode. It did increase substantially, but the percent of people who said they were from more than one race increased by only two tenths of one percent. And this is increasingly obvious across the states in the United States. As they come out, all of them are showing much smaller increases in that than we expected. Uh, if we look at this broken down by the two types of population we have by age in these data. Remember we have over 18 and under 18. Actually you get 18 and over and you can subtract and get under 18. So if you take what we call up here the adult population, you notice something interesting. And that, oops, go back. If you take the adult population, what you see is that 50% is Anglo, about a third is Hispanic, okay? Now, I want you to look at that as we go to the child population, and you basically reverse those two figures. For the under 18, it's a third Anglo, it's about a half Hispanic, and together, of course, what that means is two of every three Texas children are non-Anglo. Now, let's look at this a little bit farther, and I want to just take it by looking at one area, but many areas follow this same kind of pattern. This is the metropolitan area that's Houston, Sugar Land, Baytown. And all I want you to look at as we go through these, sorry, is to look at these two figures over here. Look at the Anglo and the Hispanic figures. Okay, at the level of the entire area, this is the total pot for the MSA. You can see it's 39% of that population of adults here. I mean, a total is, is uh, uh, Anglo. About 35% is Hispanic. When you go to the adult population, it's 43 to 32. And when you go to the under, and this is MSA as a whole now, this includes the suburban counties, it's 45% Hispanic, 30% Anglo in that under 18. Now, let's look at the city of Houston. The total population is 44% Hispanic, 26% basically uh, Anglo. When you go to the over 18, yes, that becomes about 39 Anglo, 29%, uh, 39 Hispanic, 29% uh, Anglo. But when you go to the child population, less than 15% of children in the city of Houston are Anglo. Another way to say that is 85% of the children in the city of Houston are non-Anglo. Uh, this is why sometimes I get quoted with uh, extreme statements simply saying that when you look at the children in Texas and you look at the future, you maybe don't have to say that Anglos are over, it's over for Anglos, but you do have to say that demographically the numbers are very telling and very indicative of the Texas of the future. Now, I want to do something very simple here. I'm going to just give you a set of maps. And these maps are going to do two things. They're going to tell you what counties grew in a particular racial and ethnic group and what counties declined. And if they declined, they're red. If they're blue, they had increases. And we'll start off with the Anglo population. Uh, and this is the Anglo population. In 161 of 254 counties in Texas, there was an absolute numerical decline in the Anglo population. The blue, of course, is primarily that triangle, if you will, between Dallas-Fort Worth, you know, San Antonio, Austin, and over to Houston and Galveston, uh, and with a few scattered spots, uh, particularly in those smaller county areas in the western part of the state. Now remember again, red is decline, blue is growth, this is Anglo, this is Hispanic. There were 22 of 254 counties that had declines in Hispanic populations. Now we'll look at the uh, black population. It was 102 decline, 83 growth, and these ones that are pink are ones that are too small a number of, to really talk about population change in any reasonable sense. And finally, we'll talk about Asian. Uh, that Asian population is very much concentrated in those three large metropolitan areas, and then Scattered areas that primarily have our large medical centers and university centers, uh, etc. Now, let's talk about overall uh, 
Well, let's see. Oh yeah, these are counties, we looked a little bit, play a little bit on, on the redistricting topic, I guess, was simply to look at counties in terms of Anglo majorities and those that were growing counties and those that had Hispanic majorities. This tells you that when you get to, uh, to our population and you look at the at growing areas, still a lot of them have uh, Anglo majorities. Now I want you to notice one thing. I want you to notice that among the, there, where there was no group majority, okay, you see, of course, uh, uh, Houston, and you see Dallas. Now, if you look at pluralities, what you see is that Dallas and Houston fill in as Hispanic, okay? So lots of interesting factors there. I, I'm not into redistricting. In fact, it's one of the ways I've tried to remain alive over the last few years, <laughs> as stay out of redistricting. Uh, but you can see there's gonna be some very interesting things happen there. Let's talk about aging. We're still an aging population. That has been, of course, as a result of that aging group of people called the baby boomers, those of us born between 1946 and 1964. We are basically 25% of the U.S. population, 25% of the Texas population. And in very many ways, when it comes to issues related to the aging, you know, we, we are very much at the forefront. What I, I think is very important to recognize, however, about the aging population is that coupled with it, is another very important population. And that aging population has produced for us, of course, such things as the famous quote we always hear, that one in five Americans will be 65 years of age or older. Now that is true. It's not true now. It's not true until 2020. It's not true until about 2030 when all of the baby boomers, the first of whom turned 65 this year, are 65 years of age or older. Between now and then it's probably more appropriate to think of us as an aging, middle-aged population. <laughs> but the other thing that's important to understand, and that is there's a close association between minority status and youth status. Now, this is the 2000 census, I and mean, it has all these age groups, which you do not yet have for the 2010 census. But you notice if you go over to 65 plus, that's 73% Anglo, 17% or 17 basically is Hispanic. We, this is just two groups, so African Americans, Asians, and others are not there, so they won't add up to 100%. But notice if you go to this end of the age spectrum, what do you see? 40% Anglo, 44% Hispanic, and in fact, if you take the entire population of Texas in 2000, uh, what we saw is that many of those younger age groups were a majority minority. Well, I want you to remember the blue represents Anglos, the red represents Hispanics. This is where we are in 2000. This is where we expect to be in 2010. This is 2000, this is 2010. Now often when I present that in multi-state kinds of crowds, they say, well, 240, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 240. But often when I present this, people say, well, this is Texas. What would you expect? We know Texas is a very diverse state. What's the national picture? Well, here's the national picture. This is, we've just taken and put two gross categories, Anglos and non-Anglos. And this is the picture in the 2000 census. And you see 84% of the 65-year-olds were Anglo, 16% were uh, all minority groups. Go to this end, and it's 59 to 42, or 58 to 42, basically. And guess what? This is 2000, this is 2050. In other words, look at the the height of those blue versus the red lines in 2000, and according to the Census Bureau projections in 2050. And despite what a re recent blogger told me, I do, did not bias the projections of the Census Bureau during the time that I was there. Uh, so you see that the pattern we're seeing is not just a Texas pattern. It is increasingly a national pattern as well. And as those data come out, I think we'll begin to see that. For example, the first 11, 11 states that came out. These are such hotbeds of Hispanic culture as Delaware. Now, maybe Delaware is a very Hispanic state. I hadn't thought of it. But you know that in six of the 11, there were absolute numerical declines in Anglo populations. And in every one of the first 11, the Anglo population grew slower than any other population group. And in every one of the 11, there were substantial either numerical or percentage increases in the Hispanic population. So this is increasingly national. Well, 
Many of you know that the reason I worry about these demographics at all is that due to a variety of historical discriminatory and other reasons, these demographic characteristics are tied to socioeconomic characteristics. They are tied to the resources that people have to buy goods and services in the private sector. They are tied to the resources that people have to pay taxes in the public sector. And as we change our population, if we do not change the socioeconomic factors associated with them, we will, as we change our population, change the very socioeconomic structure of Texas and, in turn, the United States as a whole. Now, the reason for that is because of these kind of relationships. And I want to go through these just to give you an idea of what's there. This is a chart that's a very interesting chart. This is from the American Community Survey. And if you look at this, this is 2009 data, and it's 1999 data in 2009 dollars. And if you look at Anglos, what you see is that they made about $60,000 in 1999. The figure shown for 2009 is not markedly or statistically significantly different from the one in 1999. Anglos, basically flat, 60,000. On the other hand, the Hispanic and the African American numbers were both lower, two to 3,000 in 2009 than in 1999, and these were significantly lower in a statistical sense from one to the other. So those differences are large. We know, and this is the figure that always startles me, that in 2000 in Texas, over 50% of adult Hispanics in Texas had less than a high school level of education. And when we look at this in 2008, the most recent numbers I had at the time I put this together, you can see at that less than high school, 8.5% of Anglos have only, or have less than high school level of education. This is for persons 25 years of age or older, and about 43% of Hispanics. So these socioeconomic differences are large and if not changed by education and other factors, uh, present some real uh, issues relative to Texas' future. Now here's a chart that has had a great deal of personal meaning to me. I've been at, oh, six different institutions of higher education in my career, either going to school or uh, being a professor. And one of the things that's always bothered me about these institutions is that in every one of them, the president of the institution was smarter than I was. Now, I could never figure out why, you know. I asked my family. I didn't like their answers. I, you know, uh, I asked my colleagues. I really didn't like their answers. But then I found this chart. Now, by the way, this is SAT scores for 2001, but it could be 2009. It could be a chart for Minnesota or Texas or Maine or Mississippi, and it would show the same kind of pattern. And this has been very, you know, consoling to me because if you notice now, this is what we use to decide who gets to go to which colleges. And if you look at the SAT scores, whether the verbal or the math, what you see is the higher your income is, the higher your score is. So this means that all these gentlemen were smarter than I am because they make more money than I do. And also means that all we need to do if we want to make Texans smarter is make them richer. <laughs> but these kind of relationships are there time after time. Uh, and so it's important that we recognize these realities as we look to the future. Well, let's talk about the future. And again, simply because I don't want us to think only of Texas, these are the Census Bureau projections. These projections are in thousands, so that 439 over there is 439 million people. You can see that that's projected that we will have a substantial increase over the next several decades. Uh, and if you see, in fact, they project 157 million, almost 156.9 million people added to the U.S. population between 2000 and 2050. Of that, the number expected to be due to the non-Hispanic white or Anglo population is 7.6 million. The amount due to the Af African American, about 17 and a half, non-Hispanic Asians, 23, all other non-Hispanic uh, groups, about 12 million. And the amount expected to be due to Hispanic populations is 97.2 million out of 157 million. Now, sometimes I'm asked, well, how accurate are long-term projections? Well, they're not very accurate at all, but they can be very inaccurate, and the direction of these changes are going to be pretty, pretty likely under almost a, a variety of scenarios. In fact, they've looked under a variety of scenarios, and they're quite, uh, quite robust in terms of over time. As a result of that, about 62 percent 
of that net growth expected as Hispanic, that or due to non-Hispanic whites alone is about 5%, 11% for African Americans, 15% for Asians, 7% related to all others. We will see, as you look at this, in about 2030, we get about 19% of our total population uh, that is expected to be uh, uh, 65 and over. And here, what I want you to do is look at the left-hand column that says non-Hispanic white alone. That's the percent of all people in those ages uh, that is Anglo. And this is 2000, and you notice that in every one of those ages, every one of them, the Anglo group is over 50%. Now I want you to look at 2050. The only age group in which Anglos are over 50% is the 65 plus age group. This gives you an idea of the kind of diversity in terms of population when you, uh, you know, counterbalance it or look at it relative to age. Well, let's talk about Texas. And I have to do something here because it'll be the only time in my life that this will be true. Uh, this is from the last set of projections I did when I was state demographer. And that bottom set down there, of course, was the one that we said would be most likely to be true. Uh, and we projected that the 2010 population would be 25,105,000. It was 25,145,000. That was one-tenth of one percent error. Now, uh, you know, what can I say except is that if I were to live to be 150, that would be the only time this would ever happen to me. But anyway, certainly where we were wrong is we projected actually a few too many Hispanics and a too few other in terms of what the actual count were, the Census Bureau did just the opposite. The Census Bureau was about 300,000 in its last estimates high for Anglos and 300,000 low for Hispanics in Texas. Well, we all know that what we expect is that by 2040, Texas will be somewhere between a quarter and a third Anglo, somewhere between 8 and 10 percent African American, somewhere between about 53 and 60 percent Hispanic, and somewhere from about 6 to 9 percent will be members of other racial and ethnic groups, primarily uh, Asian. Get an idea of what we do expect. The blue up there on the left-hand side top is those counties in Texas in 2000 where, where 50 percent or more of the population was Anglo. They're shown in blue. The right-hand chart is what we expect by 2040 under those scenarios of those projections that I said were the most accurate that we did. We will expect, again, to see an aging of the population. And let me say a little bit about the aging of the population, because one of the things that there's a lot of misunderstanding about is how pervasive this aging is. What I mean is, is often when I go on, I, I talk to a, a set of population in a suburban area. They'll say, you know, you guys throw around this figure that one in five Americans and one in five Texans will be 65 years of age or older. But you know, we live in a suburb. We're a bunch of 30 and 40-somethings with children. What are you going to talk to us about this? And of course, what I always say is that if you're very lucky in 30 or 40 years, you'll be 60 or 70-somethings without children. And that latter part is the most questionable of all, is whether they'll be without children by that time. And <laughs> some of us are expecting children to be with us when we go. But anyway, and I don't mean in the right way. OK. But if you look at this chart, this is where we were in 2000, the blue counties up there were the counties in which we already had one of five Texans that was 65 years of age or older. You can see they're primarily hill country counties and some of the panhandle of Texas and a scattering of counties uh, in East, East Texas as well. The dark green is 15% or more. So I want you to concentrate dark blue, dark green. This is 2000 and this is where we'll be in 2040. Now it doesn't mean that you can't live in a young county. You simply have to live in Waller or Webb County uh, and you can live in a young county, otherwise you're going to be stuck living with we older, older people, okay? So aging is going to be very pervasive at the same time that these other population issues, particularly the growth of non-Anglo populations, is also going to be very pervasive. Well, let's look a little bit at some of the implications of this, and I'm going to come back to that. You know, I ask people, if you don't believe the demographics, if you believe, as a gentleman that, that emailed me over the weekend, that he said that he believed that the most undercounted population, and I, I said this immediately to the Census Bureau because I'm sure they would be surprised, he said that by far the most undercounted population in the United States was the non-Hispanic white population or Anglos. Now, Census has been doing tests of this for like 40 years, and that's never been the group that we've had the most difficulty. But he was sure of that. But you know, if you don't believe the numbers, 
of the census. Let's believe just the numbers of kids that are enrolled in Texas schools. You look at this bottom. This is from a, t a st report done by Texas Education Agency. It looked at change in enrollment from 98 to 99 to 2008, 2009. You can see over here on the bottom part of this chart, okay, that showed a total increase during that period of time of 795,000 kids added to the Texas public school systems. Notice, however, that it included 130,000 white, which they mean non-Hispanic white, an increase of 103,000 African Americans, up 74,000 increase in Asian and other population, and of the 795,000, 748,000 were Hispanic. Now, you don't have to believe any of the demographics. You can just look at school enrollment and see where you are in terms of the future of Texas. What is most sobering about this, of course, in this particular chart, is that whereas the total numbers grew by 20%, the economically disadvantaged in that group grew by 40%. So these were not only minority kids, they were, in fact, relatively poor minority kids. Uh, this is an old chart, but what I'd like to show you here, I have a friend over the Capitol, one of his favorite things to ask our elected officials is what percent they think the, you know, are, are a minority in the Dallas Independent School District or the Houston Independent School District. And he tells me that he still fairly often gets, oh, you know, how, how, how much are, are, are Anglo? And he'll get, oh, 30%, 25%. Well, let's take a look, and it's really larger than this. In the Houston Independent School District right now, 8% is Anglo, 92%. If you take this, as, now this is, two, this is several years old, and you can see it was less than 5% in the Dallas Independent School District. But if you think it's just those large central city districts, most of us, at least historically, have not seen Cypress Fairbanks as a central city area. It's a pretty good suburban area, okay? What do we see happening to the Anglo proportions in basically six years, seven years, from 59% to 39 percent. You see it similarly when you look at very large changes in places like Fort Bend County, where also a lot of that minority population is Asian population. The point of it is, is the data show the same patterns, whether you look at census data, you look at institutional data on education, et cetera. Uh, it shows up some in college enrollments, but not enough. What is sad about this is if you look at the minority portions, particularly in the four-year colleges, they're not as large as we would like them to be, indicating we're not as successful in that with those particular groups of people. If we look at the projections, I'll just not look at the numbers, but you can see what we're looking at in terms of elementary and secondary. By 2040, eight of every 10 kids in our public schools uh, will be minority, and that may in fact, if the present trends continue, may be too high. Uh, uh, I mean, in terms of too low, rather. And you can see that even universities, we're talking about two of every three of the kids being in our colleges and universities uh, being uh, non-Anglo. Let's take a look just at the labor force for a minute. Labor force, dramatic changes, uh, lots of the growth in the Hispanic population. Here you can see that by 2040, uh, we can look at a labor force uh, that is at least two-thirds uh, non-Anglo, uh, maybe as much as three-quarters uh, non-Anglo. Uh, and so we see some dramatic changes. Well, what are the bottom line on some of these? What do they mean overall? Many of you know that in a work we did that got a lot of attention both from both sides of the aisle and from both sides of the political spectrum was something called the Texas Challenge and the New Texas Challenge where we said, what happens if nothing happens? And what happens if we could close, for example, some of the educational gaps? This first chart shows what happens if nothing happens and the educational differences and, and related income differences continue. And what this chart showed, that the average Texas household, in the absence of change, with the demographic changes occurring as we project them to do, but in the absence of socioeconomic improvement in the differences among racial and ethnic groups, the average Texas household in 2040 would be $6,500 poorer in 2000 constant dollars than it was in 2000. That we would see an increase in family households to about 15%, up 4% from what it was in 2000. 
And here's the one that I find most difficult. Already in 2000, 18% of our labor force was composed of people with less than a high school degree. And if we do nothing, we will by 2040 have a labor force in which 30% of that labor force has less than a high school level of education. If anyone here thinks that is the formula for high tech state, raise your hand. I don't believe it's going to be. It is a very dramatic set of events for us. Well, what can we do about it? And I'm about through for those who, that are waiting. Uh, what we did was look at this. And this chart always is everywhere the same. And this is a chart that shows that education pays. Now, these are households with, uh, if you look at these households, these are, these are household data, not individual data. And the only time I have difficulty with this particular chart is when I show it to school teachers. And for some reason, when they look at that, bachelor's degree, $81,000. Well, the only thing I can tell them, and there's obviously been a problem with withholding, what they need to go do is go back to the payroll office because there's obviously been a problem. <laughs> but when you look at these differences, they have maintained well over time. In fact, the single best predictor of income since we've started measuring this back in the 30s and 40s has been education. Now, how much difference might it make? Well, what we did here was we looked at the blue numbers up there for each of these groups are attainment levels in 2000. We projected, uh, looking at some of the positive changes that occurred in the 2000 to 2040 in the red, and we said, what would happen if the other population, primarily Asian, if we assumed that they would have those red levels of increased attainment, but what if the levels up there assumed for Anglos also applied to African Americans and to Hispanics? How much difference would it make? Well. I'll just show you with a couple charts here, and really the important comparisons are here and here. What this chart showed is if, and this is only for the population 25 years of age or older because you don't get stabilization in educational attainment levels till then. And what this showed is that aggregate household income, if we close those gaps, would increase, compare this to this, by over $300 billion per year and that we can increase consumer expenditures by over $224 billion per year. Education has paid in the history of the United States across a variety of areas and time periods. <laughs> I had to show you this because I knew that many of you were deeply moved. Okay. But well, let me summarize. Texas population growth continues to be strong. Now, that does not mean it will always be strong. But I'll tell you a little story. When I first came to Texas, I went to Texas A&M, and an elderly gentleman there that was getting ready to end his career and was helping me learn the ropes and under, learn a little bit about Texas, took me aside, and he says, now, Steve, there's one thing I want to leave you with I want you to understand. And he said that that is someday you're going to have to do something that's going to make you extremely unpopular. He thought it was population growth. <laughs> OK. But what he said was that someday you're going to have to look Texans squarely in the eyes, and you're going to have to say you're no longer growing. Well, I think if I'm pretty lucky, actually, I don't have to be too lucky, I think I'll be able to end my career never having had to say that. But that does not mean we will always grow by the level that we have been growing, and it doesn't mean that all growth is always good. Growth can be very extensive. It can be difficult to handle. Growth uh, can be, at the other hand, a godsend to an area uh, desperately trying to increase its population base and its economic base. But I think Texas is going to continue to grow, but that growth will be differentially distributed as it has been shown in the figures we've talked about here today. Let's talk about the change in the racial and ethnic composition. What I say in purely demographic terms when I'm quoted as saying it's almost over or it's basically over for Anglos, is to say that if anyone thinks that we are not going to be a very majority minority state, because we became one in absolute terms about 2003 or 2004, you're not looking at the data. The data show a young population where two of three uh, Texans are, are, are non-Anglo. The birth data show overwhelmingly that Anglos have been below replacement now for a couple of decades. And where are we going to get 
immigration from? Europe? Europe is the slowest growing region of the world and the only part of the world that the United Nation now projects to have an absolute decline between now and 2050. In fact, what I argue is there are now two populations in Texas and increasingly in America. One is an aging Anglo population, like myself, that are literally aging off the end of the life chart. And on the other end of that, is a very young population that is primarily minority. The older population Anglo, the younger population minority. Now that doesn't mean that somehow we're pitted against one another. In fact, what I argue is it means we need one another because that aging Anglo population needs a well-educated young population to pay, help pay for things like Social Security, Medicare, and provide direct health to us as we age. But that minority population also needs that older Anglo population to help pay those taxes, to help provide the education they need to be competitive in what is increasingly an international society. And I argue we have a lot at stake in one another. You know, when I argue this, some people sometimes kind of look at me funny, but you know, I could be the biggest bigot that ever walked the face of Texas and I would have to say exactly the same thing that I've just already said. Because the reality of it is that our fates are intertwined and interrelated and if we forget that, we do so to our own detriment. The reality of it is, is the future of Texas is tied to its minority populations and how well they do is how well Texas will do. Well, a lot longer ago than I like to think about when I first got involved in this demographic game, I had a fellow graduate student come up to me and he said, I feel sorry for you. And I said, well, except for the physical appearance and the intellect, why do you feel sorry for me? He said, I feel sorry for you. He said, you're a demographer and all the interesting, important, exciting things are over. He said, rural population growth rates have begun to decline. He said, the baby boom is over. What are you going to do? Well, I argued that keeping track of these and other demographic trends would, and it has, and I think it will for the rest of my career. But I would argue with you as well that demographic is not best left to demographers. If you don't take into account these and other demographic trends, as you plan for the future of your communities, as we plan for the future of this state, and dare I say, as we plan for the future of this country, we'll be much less successful than if we do take them into account. Thank you.